Welcome everybody to the Royal Asiatic Society History Club uh, online event. My name is Gabor Holsch. I am the RAS China's History Club convener. And um, I think um, if you don't know the RAS and all the exciting things that are coming up, then I can give a little bit of introduction at the very end of this event. Uh, I can see that most of you who are um, logged into the call already are members or old friends of the RAS, either Beijing or Shanghai. So I think most of you know that we are a an, uh, society with, with uh, long traditions, over 150 years of traditions, dealing with anything culture and history of China and the Asia Pacific. Um, we are the uh, China Shanghai branch, and we organize our own events, which cover, apart from history that you are attending now, also arts, urbanism. We have uh, actually um, a very interesting series of events by Bob Robert Martin, who is on the call right now, about uh, collecting historical items and, and sharing their history with each other. Probably uh, we have film events, we have fiction and non-fiction book club events. So. Actually, if you would want to attend um, all of our events, that it would keep you busy for most of the working week. Uh, the History Club is specifically, I mean, it's a uh, no man as no man. It, is, it, is, um, it deals with uh, all kinds of China and Asia history um, events, uh, topics. But we really, really like to invite speakers who bring something new to the discussion. And, you know, we, we need something new to history. We cannot just keep um, uh, talking about 1949 and the Opium War all the time. So we like having authors, we like having academics, we like having even practitioners, you know, we had uh, executives, diplomats and so on, who reveal something of the um, well-known historical events that we haven't seen yet. That can be new discovery, but it can also be a new angle. And it is this latter way, a new angle to history, which uh, makes me very happy to welcome Emily Williams. Because uh, the first thing that I spotted was uh, the book, Collecting the Revolution, if I remember the title correctly, which already the, um, the cover image, it already evokes a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of emotions for people who have been in China for 10 years or more remembering going to flea markets, go, going to Tiananmen in, uh, exactly, going to Tiananmen in Beijing or going to the fake market or, or um, the Chenghua Miao uh, Yu Gardens in Shanghai and then picking up the old uh, Cultural Revolution alarm clock, which uh, I'm a proud owner of as well, pins, uh, busts and all of those things. And then if somebody puts this, into a history, into a well-researched history, not just in terms of where geographically and culturally and historically these objects come from, but also where they go to. Now we have a very exciting story that we really want to hear. So um, Emily calls herself a cultural historian of contemporary or modern China. And um, the book is, is, a, is a, a, a proof that you bring something really fresh into the study of history and study culture. And one thing I like is, is co you consistently use the word visual, which is extremely important because, you know, if, if anybody has ever bought these or bought a po poster from the Cultural Revolution time, we know that actually there is a, there is a very intriguing, I could even say cool Im imagery be behind these, this historical era. So um, I'm sure that you will, you will tell us much more about uh, why it's so intriguing and, and why it grabbed Western audiences in particular. Uh, beyond that, I would like to uh, introduce you. I hope that you will um, introduce yourself as you take over from me in a couple of uh, minutes. I would also like to add that you are currently with Xi'an Jiaotong Liverpool University Suzhou, which I think in itself is a curiosity of the cultural environment of modern China. So maybe one thing that you can tell us uh, when you introduce yourself is, why is Xi'an Jiaotong Liverpool University in Suzhou? Uh, this is something that we <laughs> would be very interested <laughs> in finding out. I think um, as we agreed, um, and also according to the tradition of the History Club events, 
you will speak for anywhere between um, 45 minutes to an hour, and then we are still going to have enough time for everybody to ask your questions and make your comments. Now, a little bit to anticipate that, I would like to share with you a couple of ground rules that um, we try to follow to make sure that we get the absolute best out of the event time and out of uh, Emily's expertise and stories. So number one, uh, please keep it short because it is practically impossible to read something on the go, which is let's say more than three lines in the chat box. So when you um, share your questions, you share your comments, use the chat box, keep it short. Also make it clear to us whether it's a question or a comment. You know, a comment, oh, and address it to everybody, not to Emily or not to myself or, or, or anybody else, but address it to everybody. We will read your comments. Um, if the speaker or anybody else wants to reflect um, on them, then you will have the freedom to do so. If it's a question, make it very clear that it's a question. And in both cases, please um, keep it short. I don't know if now here there was a, um, a question. Um, maybe it was about my full name. So my name is Gabor Holsch, and I have been running the RES China History Club for um, nearly two years now. So with this, I would like to hand it over to Emily. We are very much looking forward to what you are going to share with us and also the discussion afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you so much, um, Gabor, and thank you everyone to, um, who's come to attend the talk this evening. Uh, I just want to start with a small disclaimer. Uh, if you hear noise in the background, um, particularly kind of a banging on the door, uh, it's my toddler in his um, last uh, kind of gasp of freedom before bedtime, uh, but he will be shortly disappearing. So uh, any noises, please just ignore them. Uh, and I'm sure anybody with small kids uh, understands what yeah, I mean. That's right. Yeah. Um, Okay, so my talk today is called um, Mao Suits on uh, Mao Suits on the King's Road, uh, the Cultural Revolution in British uh, Popular Culture. Uh, and the, the origin for this talk um, originated out of a thread that I posted on Twitter, um, which, which Gabor saw and then invited me to um, give this talk. So um, I hope you will forgive me. I'm going to start with a brief moment of self-promotion. Uh, this is uh, my book, which has just been published. Um, I am afraid to say that it, like many academic books, is outrageously expensive if you buy the hard copy. Uh, but on Kindle, it is actually more affordable. So um, if you're interested, um, please have a look at it. Uh, and if you're interested in perhaps just one chapter or something like that, um, just send me an email and I would be very happy to, to try to get you um, access to it. Uh, I can perhaps tell the sort of story of why it's called um, Xi'an Jiao Tong Liverpool University um, afterwards. Basically, I think the idea is that they didn't think foreigners would want to go to Xi'an. So I think they, they thought Suzhou would be uh, more attractive. Um, but I think you're right. So I'm, you know, Xi'an Jiao Tong Liverpool University is this kind of interesting collaboration between China and, and Britain. And that's kind of what I'm interested in my own research as well, um, although it's just kind of um, coincidental that uh, I ended up at, at um, XJTLU. Um, I have put my email address there, so if anybody has um, questions or comments um, after the talk um, is over that they would like to send to me privately. Um, May I paste can... the email address into the chat box so that it stays yeah, there absolutely. all through the presentation? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so... Um... So yeah, so this is my uh, my book. I, I'll also just note that the uh, images on the front cover uh, are actually part of a collection that we have at XJTLU um, of red culture. Uh, in normal times, I would invite all of you to come visit um, our little museum that we have at XJTLU. Uh, right now, of course, that's not possible, but we can hope um, at some stage in the future uh, when mobility is restored, um, you can come uh, see our little collection that we have. Um, so I, I'll sort of head into um, my talk now, and what I wanted to do was start by telling you a little bit about um, how the book kind of came about, how I started, um, and then go from there um, into the specific topic that I want to talk about, um, because my talk today is based on one of the chapters um, from my book. So the starting point for my book um, was my discovery that some of the UK's most famous public museums, um, the 
British Museum, the Victoria and Albert uh, Museum, the Ashmolean in Oxford, the National Museum of Scotland, amongst others, and had pretty substantial collections of objects from the Mao period, um, and particularly from the Cultural Revolution, so, so the period 1966 to 76. Um, and when I started the research for this book in, 2000, in 2011, and at that time, the image of China that was constructed in these museums in their public galleries was largely that of an imperial China. So, for example, in the old um, Joseph Ho Gallery at the British Museum, um, no post-1911 objects um, were put on display. This is different now because they've renovated the gallery. Um, but certainly when I started my research, um, this was the case. At the V&A, there were a few um, Cultural Revolution ceramics on display. But certainly the image was still overwhelmingly that of Imperial China. The Ashmolean Museum in Oxford has a rotating display of 20th century prints and paintings, um, but these are almost always non-political uh, paintings done um, often by Chinese diaspora artists. And I would say that the UK is in no way unique in this. Um, the picture of China presented in museums around the world um, was at the time I started my research and largely continues to be the case now one of imperial China, right? So focusing on this China that's kind of long disappeared um, without much attention to what has happened in the country over the last hundred uh, plus years. Given that that was the case in terms of their public displays of um, China, I was fascinated by these Mao era objects in these British public institutions, largely languishing in museum storerooms and only occasionally being used for temporary exhibitions. These objects, which are kind of undeniably political, but visually very kind of engaging and attractive, um, presented a picture of China radically at odds with that in the galleries. And I also realized that while the image of China presented in these public institutions in the UK is fairly similar to museums throughout Europe and North America, Britain is actually unique in having these Mao era political collections. Very few other institutions that collect Chinese art and objects um, in Europe or North America um, have these types of politically motivated objects. Um, so just to kind of brief uh, mention of some of these objects, you can see these uh, this badge um, at the top left. This is in the British Museum collection, um, a beautiful uh, badge from 1969. Uh, there's a ceramic in the v and collection. Uh, the, the image of the Nanjing River Bridge um, on the far right is in the National Museum of Scotland collection um, in Edinburgh. It's actually um, a mother of pearl um, on lacquer um, piece that's uh, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, some of you may recognize the four characters um, on the bottom left. This is, of course, the Gang of Four. Um, so this is a kind of toy from just um, after the Cultural Revolution uh, in the Ashmolean. And then there's a little matchbox um, that's uh, similarly in the Ashmolean collection um, that shows, uh, again, the Nanjing River Bridge. So I give you a couple of images just to show um, both the kind of breadth of um, the types of objects um, and to, to sort of just name some of the institutions that they're collected in, in the UK. Okay, so I've mentioned that these are politically motivated objects. Of course, all objects are reflected reflections of the politics and society at their moment of production. A Qianlong vase um, produced in an imperial kiln made to fill a government order and designed to display the glories of the Qing can also be understood as a political object. But there's obviously something quite distinct um, about the objects produced in the Mao era. And I was really interested in the sort of journeys they had taken or the routes um, through which they had ended up in these British institutions. So I basically started my research by looking into the sellers and the donors of these objects. Um, and this opened up a really, really rich um, series of engagements between British individuals and institutions and Mao era China. And in my book, I situate this in the context of an emerging field of academic inquiry called global Maoisms, and the interest in and influence by Mao's China on people around the world, and particularly in the 1960s and 70s. Um, I believe uh, you had Julia Lovell um, give a talk as part of this series uh, a while back. So Julia... Um, I was just about say, to mention it. She would love yeah. this. 
Yeah. Um, so Judy was actually one of my doctoral supervisors, um, and she's written perhaps the best known book um, on this topic called Maoism, A Global History, very famous. Now, we often um, talk or write about Chinese history in terms of the ways in which its encounters with the outside world has impacted it, right? We focus on the ways in which um, China was changed politically, socially, economically, um, et cetera, by Western imperialism, by global capitalism, by European ideas from both the left and the right. But the field of global Maoism aims to shift this focus and to highlight that China too has played an important role in shaping the 20th century world. Um, of course, it also played an important role in the period before that. And this was perhaps particularly true in the late Mao years, where Maoism served as an inspiration ideologically, rhetorically, but also sometimes practically um, for liberation movements in the global south, as well as um, for philosophers, uh, student movements, uh, black liberation movements, um, and other activist groups in Europe and North America. Now, Britain has been largely excluded from this academic field. And um, while there were some Maoist groups um, in the 1960s and 70s, so we can understand this as Marxist-Leninist groups who aligned themselves with China rather than with Trotskyist ideas or with the Soviet Union. They were always small, peripheral, and unable to affect any real influence, even on the left. So, um, for example, in, in Julie Lovell's book, um, she doesn't really talk about Britain um, hardly at all. And yet Britain did have its own Maoists, um, even if not in the numbers or force witnessed elsewhere. And Maoism was certainly a facet of the cultural revolution in British culture uh, and intellectual life in the 1960s and 70s. And so one of the kind of main arguments that I make in my book is that we can shift our understanding of global Maoism slightly. Much of the focus of global Maoism has been on ideology or politics. Um, and the search has been for Maoists. However, my argument is that one could engage with, be interested in, even be inspired by Mao's China um, and the Cultural Revolution without being a Maoist. The scarcity of dedicated Maoists in Britain did not, I argue, um, equate to a lack of interest in Mao's China. And so rather, I um, attempt to at least to expand the concept of global Maoism beyond a focus on the narrowly political and ideological, and to consider the topic of engagements in a broader sense, including the aesthetic and the effective. Um, I'm interested in the ways in which we make meaning through material culture. And it struck me that in the West, we have long understood China, at least in part through its material culture. It's porcelain, perhaps most famously, um, but also uh, prints and paintings and clothings, right? All of these have functioned over history to construct our idea of what China um, was and is. And so I started to look into the role that um, Chinese communism or uh, Chinese, sorry, Chinese communist or cultural revolution material culture played in reflecting, but also shaping um, people's ideas in Britain about what was going on in China. And what I found when I started looking into popular cultural representations of um, the Cultural Revolution or Chinese communism more broadly, is that while of course there are a, a range of opinions and perspectives, they often tended to situate themselves towards the extremes, um, as I'll sort of demonstrate throughout this talk. And the same Maoist material culture was used as kind of evidence um, of, uh, by both sides of the validity of their argument. Um, the material cul culture operates then as something of a kind of empty signifier. Um, they have no agreed upon meaning and therefore are open to widely um, different types of interpretations. And so I'm particularly interested in, in the idea of the Mao suit. Um, and there's this kind of wonderful quote from a fashion historian um, whose name I'm afraid I'm going to butcher, but Michael um, Langjar, um, who was talking about the uh, Western and particularly French, but um, more broadly as well, Western understandings of the Mao suit in the 60s and 70s. And he writes, either you were ideologically turned off by its indissoluble ties with communist totalitarian worker anti-egalitarianism, or you were ideologically turned on um, by its associations with the people's revolution. And so I'm essentially, I'm going to try to show how popular cultural representations of the cultural revolution map onto these ideas um, about its material culture too, um, particularly the Mao suit. <laughs> 
Okay, so let's uh, move on now to the question of how the Cultural Revolution was represented um, in British popular culture. So I want to start with an article, with a quote from an article um, from the British newspaper, The Observer, um, from 1969. Um, and this article commented uh, on the problematic way in which China was perceived in Britain and the West more broadly. Uh, and the, the, the country was seen, according to this article, in one of two quite extreme ways, both of which it argues um, are misunderstanding the country. So it says in this article uh, of China, it is neither a yellow peril of 600 million fanatics and um, setting out to conquer the world with the H-bomb in one hand and Mao's thought in the other, nor is it a paradise of true Marxist-Leninists who resemble the early Christians, not only in their moral fervor and honorable poverty, but also in their reliance on peace, uh, peaceful persuasion. Now, this quotation, while undoubtedly sensationalized, is useful because it highlights the two very different registers through which China in the late 1960s was understood. On the one hand, China was a Cold War enemy and one that took an increasingly prominent place in the global imagination in the 1960s as relations between the US and the Soviet Union gradually thawed and as the US got embedded um, in Vietnam uh, and as China positioned itself as a revolutionary model to be followed by the growing number of newly independent post-colonial countries in much of the global south. On the other hand, the Maoist revolution was seen as a people-powered revolution in opposition to Western capitalism and imperialism, and was a point of inspiration for many in the student movements throughout the Western world in the late 1960s. The Cultural Revolution, which had begun, of course, in 1966, uh, was poorly understood and consequently prone to be interpreted in extreme and reductionist ways. And so as a result, it was seen as both proof of the destructive nature of the Chinese model and its leader, Chairman Mao, and of China's claim to be at the vanguard of the global revolution. The late 1960s, therefore, was a hinge moment in which a whole series of anxieties and fears um, of both the British uh, right and left wings um, about the direction of global politics and diplomacy and British social change get expressed through a discussion about China. And so I want to highlight now that these represent representations did not accurately reflect China um, really in any way. And I think this also kind of comes um, through in this quote from the observer. So my point in this talk is not to make any sort of argument about the reality of China or China's global position in the late 1960s. Instead, I'm interested in how these almost directly oppositional images of China were constructed in Britain um, and in particular in British uh, popular culture. Okay, so um, the first sort of way in which China was um, presented was this idea of kind of China as a problem nation. Uh, and I've got this uh, from a, a, an, a book uh, written by journalist and author Charles Hensman, um, who wrote uh, in 1968, um, in a sense that was basically unequivocal about what the popular image of China was in Britain. Uh, and excuse the long quote, I'll just read it again. The overall impression one is left with is that of a China which is a problem nation on a massive frightening scale. The sense of the dreadfulness of her conduct and ambitions is created and strengthened by the sheer cumulative effects of the news reports, editorial comments, radio and television broadcasts, articles, books, uh, which report, analyze, discuss and warn about China. Most of us only half assimilate the details, but the impression remains with us. China has indeed come to be a standard and a criterion of what is bad in the international order. So Hensman suggests that the image of China constructed through the media is one of a problem nation, defined by the country's intimidating size and refusal to adhere to international norms. For a Britain struggling to find its place in the world as its empire comes to an end in most of Asia and Africa, and with a remaining colonial holding on China's doorstep in Hong Kong, China was undoubtedly a country to be watched. And one of the most common tropes through which um, China gets presented um, is through the idea of the Chinese as identical brainwashed ants. 
So, um, for example, while he would sort of go on to disagree with its veracity, the, the longtime China watcher and um, Dennis Bloodsworth writing in The Observer uh, notes the common perception of China at the start of the Cultural Revolution. And he writes to the Western observer with his inflexible dogma of liberalism, China often appears as a monstrous empire of blue ants in which the crushed, terrified, half-starved millions crawl through their bitter days, wistfully dreaming of democracy. Um, and you can similarly see uh, this um, being presented uh, on a cover of Time magazine from 1959, uh, which has, of course, Liu Xiaoqi and then this background of these ants um, busy working during the Great Leap Forward. Um, but these ideas were similarly represented, reflected, and constructed in film and television. Uh, and I want to talk about two films. Uh, one, uh, many of you probably haven't um, heard of or seen, uh, and the other uh, you most likely will have done. Uh, I would be interested at the end if um, any of you have seen this uh, to tell me your thoughts on it. So the first that I want to talk about is uh, the 1969 Anglo-American film um, called The Most Dangerous Man in the World, um, also known as The Chairman. So this was directed by British director um, J. Lee Thompson and starred the American actor um, Gregory Peck. The ideological slant of the film is, um, I should think, quite clear from its title, The Most Dangerous Man in the World. The film is set in the late 1960s and opens with a joint British, American and Soviet intelligence unit discovering that the Chinese have, de have developed an enzyme that enables crops to, glow, to grow under um, any climatic condition. So we see, for example, satellite footage of pineapples growing on the snowy Tibetan plateau. The Chinese want to use this enzyme to secure the loyalty of the developing world, uh, and the Anglo-American Soviet alliance are determined to get the enzyme for the same utilitarian purposes. Uh, and so a London-based American Nobel Prize winning scientist named John Hathaway, played by Gregory Peck, um, is chosen to go to China to try to steal the enzyme, as he is the former colleague of the Chinese scientist named Song Li, played by um, Ke Ye Luke, who developed it. Now, most of the film um, is set in uh, Cultural Revolution China, although the Cultural Revolution is never explicitly named. Um, and the country is portrayed as an entire, entirely alien uh, and other environment in which the masses have been dehumanized and turned into little more than slogan shouting, propaganda waving mobs. The difference of China, and it's a difference that's portrayed as being entirely negative, is communicated in large part through an abundance or even overabundance of material culture. And we see this already um, in the opening credits. So the opening credits, um, you can see some uh, screen grabs of this uh, on the PPT, are a montage of photographs of contemporary China, which emphasize the total saturation of Maoism and Maoist propaganda in Chinese life. So it starts off with some images um, of a kind of ancient or timeless um, China. We see some images of the Great Wall, we have an imposing um, imperial era statue, uh, and then we see a sort of poor farmer uh, on a donkey pulled cart. Um, we next see a photograph that shows a sort of poor looking Chinese village, but here we see the first sign of communism in the form of a portrait of Chairman Mao. And from here, the montage jumps immediately to an overlay um, of a group of people holding red flags. And this is followed by a constant succession of um, photographs of group study, of um, performances of revolutionary drama, um, other aspects of uh, collective life. And what's really interesting about these opening credits is we actually see two techniques being used. We have a montage of images, but these images are combined within single frames to form collages. And what these two techniques together suggest is the total saturation of Maoism in Chinese life. The Chinese are never depicted as individuals, um, even if they are alone in the photograph used, it is immediately combined um, with a photograph of a group suggesting that the actions are never truly the individual's own, um, but rather are just the manifestation of the larger social group's collective action. The only real color is from the omnipresent red flags and little red books. 
And China is portrayed as utterly dominated by the chairman's thought, a point underlined at the end of the title sequence in which a photograph of Mao himself appears hovering over another photograph of a huge crowd in Tiananmen Square and accompanied by a rousing crescendo in the music. The title sequence by um, uh, Paul Brown Constable is over three minutes long and draws on dozens of color and black and white images um, of China. Now, the photographs used um, in this montage uh, appear very similar to the types of images that, that Xinhua and the, the Chinese news agency um, exported to the West or that appeared in Chinese export publications such as China Pictorial or China Represents. Oh, sorry, China reconstructs. And as such, there's nothing inherently sinister about these images. They had actually been selected themselves as representatives of the changes underway within China. But it's how they're used in this sequence, particularly in, conjun in conjunction with the music, which gives an image of China as a sinister, dehumanized other, where individuality is suppressed and replaced by a mob mentality. And I'll just say that the whole film is um, online on YouTube, so you can um, check it out if you're interested, or at least, at least watch the opening credits, which are quite interesting. So this idea of kind of the Chinese um, uh, as this kind of dehumanized mob um, is replicated throughout the film in which Chinese people are rarely seen as individuals, but rather move in large groups. Uh, a friendly mob welcomes Hathaway at the airport, holding high Mao portraits and shouting slogans. Uh, later in the film, an unfriendly mob attacks Sun, uh, Song Li for his revisionist thinking, again, holding high Mao portraits and shouting slogans. And so the depiction of Chinese people immediately recalls the sort of blue ant trope so common in the West and leaves the viewer in no doubt about the reality of China. It is a totally foreign world, peopled not by individuals, but by crowds subsumed within an ideological framework alien to that of the free West so-called free West. Now, the only Chinese characters who get any real kind of character development um, are those who do not wear the Mao suit. Um, and this is Song Li, the Chinese scientist who developed the enzyme and his daughter Song Chu, um, both of whom wear um, sort of traditional Chinese clothing. These two are humane, individualistic, and in touch with the China that the communists are portrayed as destroying. There is, however, one scene where the scientist daughter changes into um, what we're meant to sort of understand as a red guard outfit, so a military style jacket, uh, a Mao badge and a red guard armband um, in an effort to fit in with the crowd. And when dressed as such, she criticizes her father for his unwillingness to subsume his individual will to the requirements of the revolution. Soon after, the scientist Song Li commits suicide, and we see Song Chu, his daughter, back in her traditional silk jacket, lamenting her father's fate and rescinding the responsibility she had so recently ascribed to him. Clothing in the film then becomes a marker for ideological positioning, and in it, the Mao suit and Red Guard clothing become shorthand for mindless devotion to a totalitarian regime. And you can just uh, see the... Um, uh, image of Song Chu uh, dressed as a red guard on the, the PowerPoint there. Now, Hathaway eventually um, escapes, uh, taking with him Song Li's little red book. Uh, and once back in London, he discovers that Song Li had traced in lead pencil over the letters um, for the enzymes uh, molecular formula in the little red book, thus communicating to Hathaway the secret of his discovery via the medium of the chairman's words. The cultural revolution is experienced in the film through a profusion of material culture with crowds characterized by Maoist objects. Um, but at the same time, it's this material culture that provides the means for Song Li to sneak his formula out of the country and consequently bring about the plot resolution. Now, there was also uh, another uh, perhaps uh, more popular uh, series of films um, which similarly used the Mao suit as what I'm going to sort of call like a shorthand for evil. And this is, of course, the James Bond films. As we all know, I think the James Bond films were based on books by British author um, Ian Fleming and starred a British hero, although actually most analysis of the films has positioned them within the context of the Cold War in which Bond is fighting for or legitimizing um, American values. However, I think it's worth noting that while James Bond as the hero represented Western or even American interests, the villains were not so clearly nationalized. 
The main enemy for much of the 1960s and 70s was um, Spectre, the special executive for counterintelligence, terrorism, revenge, and extortion, a shadowy um, corporation. Many of the villains appeared to be from the Soviet Union or Eastern Europe, but they were not necessarily representing um, communist governments in those territories. And on a number of occasions, Bond works with the Soviet representatives to fight against Spectre, uh, and Spectre would attack both the Soviet Union and communist China in different films. So the world of James Bond is very clearly classified in, um, uh, in sort of these binary terms of good versus evil, but these values were not necessarily mapped um, quite so precisely onto West versus East um, or even capitalist versus communist. And it's significant then that the main leader of Spectre, um, Blofeld, typically were, wears a, a Mao suit um, or something similar to a Mao suit. Um, and in one particularly interesting uh, scene, uh, in Diamonds Are Forever, uh, it transpires that Blofeld had used plastic surgery to create a series of doppelgangers, um, and Bond might, must fight against a series of identical Blofeld lookalikes. This proliferation of Mao-suited villains recalls and reinforces the Cold War conception of identical Chinese ants. Blofeld is very clearly not Chinese, but within the transnational or perhaps even denationalized space of Spectre, a corporation run without recourse to human values and dedicated only to power, Blofeld's Mao suit can be seen to draw on already existing ideas about the Chinese, represented through their characteristic clothing as representing the antithesis to Western values. So um, in kind of conclusion of this section, Mao's China was repeatedly constructed in the British mainstream media as embodying dehumanizing totalitarian evil. This was constructed visually, including through reference to the Mao suit as embodying both the perceived conformity of Chinese society and China's rejection of the norms of international political and social discourse. While, however, these may have been the kind of dominant positions on China, they were by no means the only ones. And indeed, in the same areas in which China was seen as a threat, its revolutionary nature and its refusal to adhere to established political or socioeconomic norms were also the areas uh, in which uh, China was celebrated by its supporters. And for those sympathetic to China uh, in Britain, the country was doubly maligned both in the antagonism of the US or the West uh, and the resulting kind of hot periods of war uh, in East Asia, but also in the vilification of China by much of the global left following the Sino-Soviet split of the early 1960s. Consequently, China's supporters in the West often felt that the country was disparaged from all angles. And for these supporters, China was a country that merited not fear, but admiration um, and support. Uh, and this position was initially kind of popularized through the student movements of the late 1960s, um, but then actually becomes somewhat more mainstream um, in the early 70s, particularly after the PRC entered the UN in 1971 and US President Richard Nixon's much publicized visit in 1972. Now, the actual kind of specific influence of the Cultural Revolution on the student movement in Britain was often somewhat diffuse, um, but it was also present in a variety of ways. Uh, according to the historian Adam Lent, uh, it is often forgotten that Maoism was one of the most influential strands of Marxist thought for the student left in the 1960s. Uh, and he writes, while specifically Maoist groups in Britain were amongst the most fanatical, centralist, and tiny, the wider Maoist current inspired many activists. And I think this can be demonstrated in a quote from David Fernbach, a student at the London School of Economics and a radical member of the Socialist Society, who recalls the idea that the Cultural Revolution had on him. He, he writes, as important as the cultural, the counterculture, if not more so, for many radicalized students was the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Although it took us a long time to understand much about it, except that it was a great upheaval, that in some ways it was against authority, and that the entrenching of a new system of privilege and power uh, in post-revolutionary society, it had a great effect on us morally. Uh, for some, the upheaval um, 
uh, and the fight against uh, the authority figures of the Cultural Revolution was sort of reinterpreted or seen in light of their own protests. And um, so Kim Howells, for example, who was active in the student occupation um, of the Hornsey College of Art in May 1968, uh, saw his own actions in light of those ongoing in China. Uh, and he wrote, I was very keen on storming buildings. I really saw myself as a red guard uh, when I went in and told the principal of Hornsey College of Art that he he had to leave his office because the student body had decided we needed it. Um, Howells was also involved in clashes with the police during um, an anti-Vietnam protest uh, and later was a, a Labour MP. Um, others were in interested in China's um, development path, um, both as an alternative for the newly independent post-colonial nations, um, but also in some cases for, for Britain. Um, so Delia Davin, who's a name that some of you might know, she was a historian of China uh, and she also lived in China between 1963 to 65 and then later again um, in uh, 1975 to 76. She um, described to me the importance of China's anti-imperial and anti-colonial positioning in sparking her interest in the country. And she recalled China meant third world above all for me and um, her husband, uh, then husband, uh, Bill Jenner. Uh, it is not altogether irrelevant, she says, uh, that my elder sister went to Algeria when I was in my second year in China and my younger sister went to Zambia. We belong to a generation when radical people felt the third world was where it was all at, where interesting things were happening and where we wanted to be. Particularly in the 1970s, professionals in education and healthcare made trips to China and upon their return would frequently publish articles either in the mainstream media uh, or in journals such as China Now, which was the journal of SAKU, the Society for Anglo-Chinese Understanding, the main Sino-British friendship group throughout this period, in which they defended the applicability of Chinese innovations to the British welfare system. Now, just as I suggested that critics of Maoism and the Cultural Revolution used its material culture both implicitly and explicitly as evidence of their views, so too is the case with China's supporters. And indeed, for some, encountering Chinese material culture could have quite an effect. The comedian Alexei Seil recalled his first encounter with Maoism um, in the form of material culture uh, during an anti-Vietnam War protest uh, in Liverpool in the early uh, in early 1967, uh, and he writes, there was this extraordinary guy walking along um, by himself. He had long hair, a straggly beard, and a floor length overcoat. Using both hands, he carried in front of him a large poster of Chairman Mao Zedong attached to a tube of gray plastic piping. As we passed a Chinese restaurant on Lime Street, all the waiters and chefs piled out of the restaurant, cheering him and making the waving a little red book gesture. I'll be honest, I'm a little bit skeptical that this is what happened at the Chinese restaurants, but um, this is what he, he says in his, his autobiography. Now, Seil was brought up in um, a very orthodox communist household, and he soon joins this Maoist that he had seen on this protest in a Marxist-Leninist reading group in Liverpool, and he later joined the China-oriented Communist Party of Britain Marxist-Leninist um, uh, and in London. And for him, the effective pull of the countercultural appearance of this Maoist that he sees in the protest came from its divergence from the rigidity and the puritanism of his communist upbringing. In this sense, the impact of Maoism in China was as much about feeling and style as it was about ideology. The 1960s saw an explosion of new fashion styles and a new focus for many young people in self-expression through fashion. The Mao suit emerged as one of a number of new fashion options uh, in the late 1960s and early 70s. And um, it was successful, I think, because of its kind of specific range of connotations. Firstly, it was associated with the East and had uh, meanings within the contemporary interest in Oriental exoticism, um, publicized perhaps most famously through the Beatles. Secondly, uh, the Mao suit had an implicit uh, militancy. Uh, it's based initially on the uh, early 20th century Japanese military uniforms, but was also associated with Maoist guerrilla warfare. 
which spoke to the kind of combativeness of young people. And then thirdly, it had proletarian associations with, which coincided with the revival of Marxism uh, and young people's professed allegiance to the proletariat in the late 1960s. As a result, uh, the Mao suit became a fashion option and British designers began making their own versions. Mates by Irving Sellers, a fashionable store on London's Carnaby Street, for example, uh, sold what they called red guard suits um, in dark blue and green for men and women. Uh, an article by Ian Dallas in the radical underground newspaper, um, IT or International Times, uh, reported that Michael Rainey's boutique, uh, Hung on You, sold uh, what he calls a quilted jacket buttoned high in the style of Mao that was called the Great Leap Forward. Uh, and Dallas reports that the jacket was the store's most popular item. Moreover, in Hung On You, a shop best known for its flowery shirts and caper ties uh, in bold colors, the Chinese influence ran uh, deeper than just these quilted jackets. Uh, according to the counterculture figure uh, Barry Miles, uh, Rainey became inspired by the Cultural Revolution uh, and installed a huge photograph of Chairman Mao's famous 1966 swim in the Yangtze River um, in his shop on Chelsea's King's Road, hence the title of my talk. According to Dallas, uh, wearing a Mao jacket was not just about fashion, it was, he wrote, an outward sign of the invisible change in the thought structures of the young people of this country, as the Cultural Revolution had inspired them to reconsider the basic tenets of their own society. And Dallas acknowledged that the situations in Britain and China were fundamentally different, but perhaps not in the way you might expect. He wrote, of course, their situation is not ours. Embedded in a stale, rundown capitalist puppet state, we can only identify with the exultant youth of China by vicarious gesture, reading Mao's handbook and wearing the Great Leap Forward, the Mao suit. Owning, wearing, or displaying these Chinese objects were then um, a way of constructing a shared experience uh, with these admired Chinese youths. As objects widely associated with red guards, they became objects in common, a transnational link that symbolized the shared dream of an alternative socialist modernity. And as part of this shared experience then, the Mao suit became uh, a symbol of um, commutarian human relations and not, as in some interpretations, mindless totalitarianism. Now, I should note that I'm not saying that everyone was walking down Carnaby Street wearing a Mao suit. It was certainly still a pretty um, marginal sartorial choice. But certainly there were some people who made um, gestures in that direction. Uh, and while some wore the sort of more standard um, Mao suit, others kept the style or aspects of the style, and um, primarily the kind of buttoned up, turned down collar, um, or the patch pockets with the pointed flap design, um, but changed other aspects. Um, Leng Jar comments that in France, such was the interest in Maoism and Mao suits that, uh, quote, anything remotely Chinese looking would in the loosest possible way be called Mao. And indeed, many of the Mao suits or the so-called Mao suits from the 1960s would be more correctly called Nehru jackets, um, as they had the short um, upturned uh, Mandarin collar uh, a style long pre-existing, but popularized by the Indian Prime Minister um, Nehru. Um, and so many of what gets called Mao suits are actually, in fact, Nehru suits. The Beatles uh, brought these suits to popular attention by wearing uh, a kind of hybrid. So uh, a Nehru collared jacket with Mao style uh, uh, patch pockets um, in their 1965 performance at Shia Stadium um, and in the 1965 film Help. These are not Mao suits that would be recognized as such in China, but they traded off of the contemporary interest in China and Chinese communism in Britain at this time. For Guardian journalist and academic John Gittings, uh, the appeal of Maoist attire was similarly about communicating a difference. He bought a number of Mao caps on a Saku organized trip to China in 1971, uh, and he told me that he wore one in London for many months upon his return. But the Mao cap was only one part of his look, as he frequently paired it with a Chilean poncho. Gittings concluded, and this is a quote, uh, I think it was uh, more a 1970s alternative culture fashion statement than anything else. Perhaps also I enjoyed the disapproval of the more somber uh, uh, China watchers at SOAS and, and Chatham House. 
So my argument is that Maoist clothing, jackets and caps were a way of constructing and communicating a left wing identity and perhaps a certain sympathy for China. But their iconic um, importance outweighed their ideological alignment. Maoism then functioned more as style, as affect, than as true ideological inspiration. So in just a brief conclusion, um, in this talk, I, I've drawn on a variety of British popular cultural sources in order to dry, draw out something of the diversity of opinions about the Cultural Revolution in 1960s and 1970s Britain. While mainstream media opinion was um, overwhelmingly negative, particularly in the late 1960s, we also see another side in the counterculture. Uh, and I have argued in both cases that Chinese material culture um, or appropriated or adapted uh, versions of it uh, played a key role in shaping and communicating these views. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, finish there and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emily. There's, there is an awful lot to reflect on. So I would like to encourage everybody to type your comments or questions into the chat box. Please uh, keep it uh, clear if it's a comment or question. Keep it um, brief so that we can read it and reply to them at the same time. And also, if you would rather ask your question or make your comment through the microphone, then uh, simply um, Unmute yourself and wait for a couple of seconds and and then see if if anybody is speaking at the same time. Frankly, um, at this point in the evening, uh, probably uh, there is usually not not an awful lot of uh, awful long queue for my comments, but but this option is open as well. Okay, now <clears throat> um, I will help you, um, Emily, just to to read it out. We already have one good and one not so good example because uh, Julie's question is exactly what we have in mind, whereas Drew um, wrote us an amount which is, makes it a little bit difficult to read. Just please remember that the speaker or myself, if you send us something like this, is expected to spend a couple of minutes just reading, which is not the best um, use of our time. So if you can phrase your question or comment in a short way, that would be highly appreciated. So... Um, uh, Julie says, Andy Warhol created his Mao screen in 1972. How much did this influence the Maoist suit culture in the UK? This is a very good question. So basically, who were the trendsetters? Were, the, were, were, was, were it the Maoists or um, the fashion impresarios? Yeah, thank you, Julie. That's um, a great question. And I mean, you could give a whole other talk about uh, representations of, of Mao in, in art. So one of the things that's really interesting is that um, around this time and actually prior to Andy Warhol doing it, quite a number of um, the most famous uh, artists were also using Mao's image in a variety of ways. Um, figures like uh, Lichtenstein, um, uh, Reinhardt, um, all sorts of people were, were making images um, of, of Mao. So Warhol was, uh, I think, part of the trend um, in that, and he actually wasn't the first. Um, but certainly he becomes the most famous for it. Um, so I think I would sort of see this as just kind of um, reflecting and elevating a trend as opposed to setting it. Um, yeah, I think that's what I'd say. So uh, it's it would have sort of raised attention um, of these kind of Maoist images. Um, but I think for people that were sort of really interested in, in Maoism already, you know, the, the image wasn't um, perhaps uh, that new. Yeah, I was I was wondering about one issue is um, where did this imagery enter people's uh, consciousness, basically? So could they see, have seen it on television or is it through the people who visited China? So I think both. Um, one of the interesting things is one of the kind of most popular shows in Britain at this time was um, Monty Python. Uh, and uh, Monty Python has... Uh, I can't remember the exact number now, but a really large number of skits that reference um, Chinese communism um, in some way, but usually in a kind of negative sense. So um, there's one. Very much that so. I... Sorry? Very much so, yes. Yes, right. So, you know, this idea of kind of, you know, the Chinese people overtaking the world through their kind of numbers. Um, there's a sort of uh, famous one where uh, this 
woman kind of gets eaten by um, Chinese people. Um, and there was um, other sort of similar shows uh, that kind of, yeah, make reference to the Cultural Revolution, um, but almost entirely uh, negative. Um, and I, I similarly, in my research, uh, read through every reference to the Cultural Revolution um, in most of the UK's uh, most widely published uh, newspapers. And again, they are almost entirely negative um, in their discussion of China, particularly in the late 1960s. In the early 1970s, when more visitors start to go, we start to see a slightly different impression of China because um, we see a lot of publications of people's um, visits. And of course, as we know, these visits to China were highly stage managed. Uh, and so people come back with these kind of glowing impressions um, of this kind of new um, uh, sort of type of society that's being constructed in China. Um, and so what I would say for those more positive um, impressions is they sort of work in tandem with this material culture that the Chinese government is producing and exporting. So, for example, um, if you wanted your own copy of the Little Red Book, you could just go to the Chinese embassy in London and get, request a copy and they would sort of just give it to you. Um, you could also sort of write to them and they would send you all sorts of kind of pamphlets and material for free. Um, and similarly, there was a number of um, stores and um, sort of, you know, stalls that uh, sent it. I can uh, go back and show an image. Yeah, so the top image that you can see there is somebody selling um, the Little Red Book and um, other types of uh, uh, Marxist, um, as well as kind of Chinese communist uh, material um, in a stall in Hyde Park in London. Um, so this material was, you know, certainly kind of available. Uh, and then I think this material culture that the Chinese government was exporting was then kind of um, used as evidence to back up this kind of popular, um, uh, sorry, positive impression that, that people are giving after they've had these short right. um, visits to China. So I think basically the material culture kind of works in both ways um, to either undermine your view that the Cultural Revolution is a kind of civil war, chaos, madness, um, or uh, that it's this attempt to produce a whole new culture. Um, so I think that's what we see. But I, I would guess that for most people in Britain, uh, the impression was largely negative. Then we had two questions, one from Drew and one from Peter, which basically asked the same thing. Who collected the souvenirs that you showed us and how did they make their way into those collections? Yeah, so, um, so Drew, in answer to your question, I would say that in my um, experience, the uh, kind of more um, fully Maoist people were actually less likely to collect these objects. Um, and I uh, had one interview with um, somebody who was part of uh, the um, communist Marxist-Leninist in the um, 60s, who said that he didn't want to collect it because that was fetishizing um, the material culture and therefore not a very kind of communist um, thing to do. So I would say that um, they were in general not the people to um, collect these things. Although in some cases, you know, they had a few objects that they had bought from left-wing bookstores um, or on protests that they kept for, you know, sentimental reasons because they were important to them um, and maybe now have uh, private collections, but they in general haven't entered um, the, the British public institutions. Um, so in answer to the question about um, to question, um, can you say more about who donated the artifacts held in British institutions? Um, so the answer to that is uh, largely uh, people who went to China in the 1970s. Um, and that includes both the sort of first generation of students who got sent by the British Council um, and people who went on, um, on short-term uh, visits. Uh, so if we just go to my final slide, um, I can just sort of mention a few of the, the people who own these objects. Uh, so this uh, lovely enamel mug uh, was, uh, in fact, is owned um, by uh, Francis Wood, um, who was later the Chinese uh, 
the lead curator of um, the Chinese collection at the British Library. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was a student um, in China in the mid 70s, has written a very entertaining book about her time. Uh, so she basically collected um, enamel cups that had writing on them. Um, she was in China to, to study the language. And so I think she was interested in kind of slogans and um, language um, on this material culture. Uh, and she made um, a pretty substantial collection of um, these, these cups. Right. Uh, this one here is very um, interesting. This is a woodcut that is owned by George Walden, um, who was later a conservative um, MP and a minister um, under Thatcher. Uh, and he was in China in the late 1960s as a uh, diplomat. Um, so he kind of collected these things, but he's kind of completely um, uh, against um, all aspects of, of Chinese um, mm. communism, but could understand, could appreciate some of its um, material culture. Uh, this um, beautiful uh, anti-American uh, imperialism and anti-Soviet revisionism poster at the bottom um, was uh, is owned by um, Paul Crook. So the Crook family um, are probably quite a well-known family, uh, supporters of the Maoist government and the children uh, were, were raised um, in China. And, and Paul was um, a pretty prolific collector of posters and um, badges and stamps um, in uh, the 1960s and 70s until he, he left um, to go abroad for education. Uh, and his collection um, was for a long time housed in the um, University of Westminster, um, which was uh, has a big collection of posters that was um, uh, founded by John Gittings when he was um, a lecturer mm. there. So it's these kinds of people who either went on short term visits, um, who were there as diplomats, but I'd say the largest number of them are people who um, were there as students in the 1970s, and then in many cases um, followed um, up with uh, careers in, um, in China in some capacity. Uh, uh, so a lot of them ended up as curators at these institutions that ended up Makes collecting sense. the objects. Makes sense. Bob, would you like to ask, ask, ask your question right now? Yes, I can ask. I'm sorry, I mistyped with my finger on my phone. Uh, I was just, I uh, thank you very much, Emily. It's really fascinating. Uh, uh, I have uh, a number of uh, cultural revolutionary objects in my house, which I find have a certain kitschy, cool beauty about them. But I would, I would never collect, uh, let's say, Nazi memorabilia or even Stalinist objects, I don't think, and put in my house. Do you have any idea of why one would be more acceptable? Why the Maoists? Maybe you've answered in a sense. Why these Maoist things are cultural revolutionary objects, while they represent a time that was had lots of uh, difficulty and misery, are st still have some sort of uh, beauty or acceptability for us. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Robert. That's a really good question. I think part of the reason is exactly kind of what I was saying today, which is that there was already these kind of conflicting associations with them um, already at the time. And particularly this idea of them as being kind of kitsch um, already starts to appear um, in the 1970s. Um, and so, you know, we sort of see them as kind of harmless, right? And I think, you know, some of these kind of artistic um, uh, interpretations of Mao um, by Warhol or by others contribute to that because, you know, they turn him into this kind of funny or kind of cutesy um, uh, leader who's not really somebody to sort of take seriously, but just um, is kind of, you know, visually attractive. So I think to a certain extent, we sort of uh, detach the image from, from the kind of politics that, um, that it represented. Um, so I, I think that's that's probably my my best explanation. There is a Thank good you. question here <clears throat> from Patty. Why is the global Maoist movement or style influence seldom reported or mentioned in China? And I, I can definitely agree that it is not. Because uh, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, I would say my answer would be because the type of politics that uh, was represented um, at that time is kind of anathema to the current government, right? It's a kind of revolutionary overthrow of authority um, based on a kind of people powered um, political movement that is probably not very popular right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I, often when I tell people, you know, about my research 
people really had no idea, um, you know, at that at the time that people even knew about what was happening outside China, much less were interested in it, much less were inspired by it. Um, and so it's, it's, yeah, it's an interesting um, fact. Let me go on to the next one. Uh, while we see parallel between cultural revolution and Kim's rule over North Korea, what is the inner reason that made China uh, walk out of, of the cultural revolution while North Korea stayed the same? I don't know if you feel this question is relevant to your the topic of your uh, presentation right now. It's a bit of a like I, a I don't think I can question. offer. And I don't really know enough about North Korea to talk about um, to talk about it as a comparison. Uh, I think if we sort of are interested in why China uh, changed path after the end of the Cultural Revolution, um, it's, I think maybe it's too, compli <laughs> too complicated to answer. It's a combination of, um, you know, political decisions being made to preserve regime legitimacy that um, encourage them to take a different kind of economic path. Mm. And then there were a couple of, um, there was, there was uh, Bob's question about, about why, why, uh, collecting uh, Maoist memorabilia is better than uh, collecting, let's say, Nazi memorabilia. Um, and also there is a, a bit of a discussion going on in the chat module right now. And, and what sprang to my mind, and I would just like to get your take on it, is is it possible that simply uh, it's, it's goofy and funny and, and tacky because simply we know less about the political events there if we, we look at it from a Western perspective? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, China has always been kind of peripheral to a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the countries of the West. And, you know, there's not necessarily that much interest in it. Um, and therefore, it doesn't have to be taken that seriously. Um, but, you know, Stalin and, and um, you know, the Nazis are in a kind of completely different category. Right. One of the things I find interesting at XJTLU is we, um, at least pre-pandemic, had a lot of Liverpool to come over for uh, to do a year in China, and they really, you know, in a lot of cases, not not everyone, of course, but really know nothing about China. Um, they've never heard of Mao, you know, have don't know really what the CCP is, or you know, any of these things that um, you uh, maybe I initially assumed were kind of um, self evident, but you know, in Britain, there's not a ton of awareness about. Um, uh, about um, China and usually not that much interest. Mm. Um, so it's easier to just, you know, in, in, appreciate the aesthetics without worrying too much about the politics. Right. And if anybody has ever lived in China and had like a, <clears throat> a bunch of Chinese uh, roommates or perhaps married to Chinese or something, somebody like this, I think, especially my generation, I was born in 71. So, uh, you know, something like this, my, my 1968 little red book that, that is tolerated by my Shanghainese wife, but nothing bigger than that. So you definitely cannot slap one of these cultural revolution memorabilia on the wall or, 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 or put a plate in the kitchen or something like this. So I think, I think Ch uh, Chinese people who, let's say my generation or older, who lived through this time, they have a completely different take on the, on the funniness and techiness of these objects as well. Have you, have you done research or have you talked to people about this? Yeah, so my, my current book project um, looks, in fact, at collectors of these objects in China. Um, so the objects, um, they're called red relics, Hong Su Wen Wu, um, mm. and the collection is just um, Hong Su Shou Tang, right? It's a red collection. Uh, and this is actually a surprisingly big field in China. There's um, certainly tens of thousands of serious collectors um, and probably kind of hundreds of thousands of kind of more, um, you know, hobbyists uh, who collect things, um, particularly badges, posters, stamps, um, but really actually everything these days um, can be collected. Um, so I know three separate people who claim to be China's biggest collector of Maoist notebooks. Mm -hmm. um, people collect, uh, you know, cigarette packets, uh, you know, alcohol bottles from that period, pretty much anything that kind of uh, makes reference to the aesthetic of um, the Mao era has relations um, with the sort of history of the CCP or the PLA um, can be collected. And I should note that that's also including the sort of revolutionary pre-1949 period, as well as the Mao era. Um, and a lot of these people are in a way, rather nostalgic about the Mao years. Um, some of them have fared quite well in the reform era, some of them have not. 
but there's often this kind of feeling that um you know the the sort of values that they were taught as youths about kind of you know justice and fairness and equality have been left behind in the reform era um and there's a you know a certain sort of bitterness about that for some people right and um, this feeling that there was a kind of pure um motivation um in the past that gets embodied in these objects um so yeah it's a it's a um surprisingly large field have you ever met anybody in china who used to be a red god and then uh, they uh they became both the collectors of uh culture revolution time memorabilia and the kind of antique kind of guilt induced antique collection because they destroyed so many beautiful things i met a couple of fascinating people like that in china i've never thought about it in terms of the kind of guilt um induced that's what they told me antique. yeah I I guess they've never framed it to me in that sense but certainly yeah I mean a lot of these collectors um particularly if they have a lot of money um will collect kind of red but also collect um imperial often things like kind of you know furniture or um uh, pottery that sort of thing Now Emily have you got your own sizable collection I do but it's actually um all stuff that's been uh gifted to me. Um so uh since I've been um working at XJTL you have been going around and interviewing um all of these uh collectors in China and um they're often incredibly hospitable and they give me objects. Uh so I have uh yeah, a fairly decent collection of uh Chairman Mao badges, I've got a couple of posters. Um I'm trying to get a, a an enamel plate. I think that's what I'd really like next. Oh. how did it start i mean this i'm really interested in it because obviously uh these are <clears throat> these are hobbies but obviously you studied um history and what started you on this journey i i did history for my undergraduate degree um and i got quite frustrated from what i saw as a kind of over-reliance on um or perhaps a sort of uncritical reading of archives um and a sort of you know maybe a lack of interest in how material culture um can also tell us interesting things about history so i i started thinking about the role of objects in history and particularly the ways in which individuals construct their identities through their engagements with the material world around them um and i guess i was sort of interested in in left wing political theory at the time and in china uh, and so all of those sort of came together in my topic excellent i will ask you one more question and then <clears throat> anybody because i can see most of what is ap- appearing in the chat box are are comments now and reflecting on each other which is uh, absolutely great because we have we have a very interesting parallel discussion um, unfolding here but i would like to ask you one more question and i would encourage everybody to type if you have any more questions into the box um there are there are always in in china these kind of little legends uh, that you can hear and sometimes they turn out to be complete nonsense and sometimes the experts will tell you it's absolutely true and whenever i bought something which i do have here it's uh, you know um mao zedong and ling biao tea set a uh, cake of tea with some cultural revolution imagery on it they told me that the main reason why they did that is because uh, many areas in china were remote and they they hadn't even heard of the change of leadership they hadn't heard the start of cultural revolution so it was basically in the absence of telegraph and the good postal service this was something of a kind of a, a news flash printed on tea cups and and uh, tea bags What do you know about this? Is that true? I don't know about that in terms of the in terms of porcelain production but certainly in terms of printing of posters. It was a way of disseminating information as quickly as possible. Um and one of the things that's that's remarkable is you can sort of find the timeline for the production and then the dissemination of certain um particularly famous uh paintings for example and it could happen remarkably quickly right when um you know the message was uh you know wanting to be communicated or when a particular um painting was uh you know deemed to be um you know uh influential um but in terms of uh on porcelain uh i don't know but i would be very interested to know more about that that's fascinating i will send you the picture of my tea set it's an entire tea set with with pot and and a couple of a few cups which literally says with the with the correlating imagery Mao Zedong and Ling Biao have started the cultural revolution together 
So it really looks like a news flash printed yeah. on a tea set. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Bob, your hand is up again. No, you just forgot to put it down. <laughs> okay. No, no um, hand up, sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry. So um, one thing that we can do is if you if you have a if you have a little bit of a mood to to multitask to just scroll through the uh, the chat module where there was a discussion about comparison between nostalgia for Maoist China and nostalgia for Stalinist Russia. Obviously, this would be also from the from the visual perspective. This would be another um, interesting thing uh, to look at. Um, or anything else that you would like to share with us that we haven't asked you about? I just noticed there's a comment from WND2 um, that said, before ping pong firsthand reporting of China was quite limited, um, how did the remoteness of the culture contribute to the interest in after Nixon? How did it change? Um, and that's certainly true. Of course, one of the, you know, the, the important factors in the early um, period of the Cultural Revolution is just that the foreigners left, right? There was hardly any um, journalists um, left in, in, in China. Um, and of course, um, Anthony Gray, who was um, here, was um, put under house arrest for, for, for five years or, or something like that. And so certainly, you know, most of the reports that were being written about China were coming from reporters based in Hong Kong. Um, and it was based on um, either uh, information they could get from refugees who were leaving China, or from their kind of interpretations of the official news being published um, by the government. And so certainly this kind of encourages a certain type of reading, right? And I think that impacts um, on, on the way it gets reported in this right. kind of overwhelmingly um, and entirely negative way. Uh, and then, you know, after Nixon, um, and really kind of from 1971 onwards, so even prior to Nixon, we start to see uh, more and more of these visits being organized. Of course, still very small numbers, um, but in the UK, uh, this organization that I mentioned, SACU, the Society for Chinese um, for Anglo-Chinese understanding, was able to organize um, a number of visits uh, every year. Um, and uh, people would um, go on them and they would often bring back um, objects with them, many of which have now entered these public collections. And they would write articles for um, a lot of the main uh, newspapers. Um, so kind of giving us a different picture um, of China. So, so certainly there is um, this access, this question of access to China certainly impacts upon how it gets written about in the media. I was very surprised to find out from Julia Lovell's book on uh, global Maoism that foreigners, pre-ping pong, so to speak, who did visit China, they were carefully kept from each other. So they didn't know of one another's existence and they were very often discouraged to tell too much about what they experienced there, which would be coincidentally exactly the situation in today's North Korea. Yeah, what there's um, uh, uh, somebody called Richard Kirkby, uh, Kirby, who has um, written an autobiography about his time in China in the 70s. Um, he uh, was an academic who wrote one of the early books on Chinese urbanization, um, which it's actually very good, even though it was written a long time ago, it sort of holds up quite well. Um, but he was uh, based in Nanjing and then in Jinan um, in the uh, mid 70s and there was really not a lot of foreigners there at the time um, and he talks about yeah kind of this feeling that they were being kept apart from each other um, not a lot of help was made um, for them to learn Chinese uh, and so you know they were really kind of kept very um, you know, isolated and far away from the culture. Uh, and and one of the, the things that, that Richard Kirkby does is he buys all of these um, little books uh, that uh, have kind of text and image, and he uses them to study Chinese himself. Uh, but he also turns this into like a little collection, um, which he's now um, uh, sold to the, to the Ashmolean Museum. Um, and he also collected posters. And um, so one of the arguments that I, I make in, in my book is that because of the kind of remoteness of Chinese culture to people, even when they were living in the country, um, material culture becomes a way of trying to understand more about China, um, even while they're living there. Thank you very much. I, I cannot see any more questions coming in. 
but we still have a couple of uh, minutes on the clock and there is not an awful lot from me to announce in terms of RAS because uh, we still don't know when our next event is going to come up, uh, at least for the history club. So I would just like to ask you, is there, is there anything that you would, you would like to, uh, to share with us about the book, about your upcoming project, about your life in China right now that we haven't asked you about? Well, I, I might turn this around and make it a question to the audience, um, which is, um, are there any people who uh, have, you know, engaged it, with these objects in, in any way? Um, you know, did seeing these objects uh, at any point in your life impact your understanding of China? Um, so, yeah, are, are there any kind of stories that people have to do with these objects um, that, that I could learn from? Well, I can I can start because uh, I arrived in China in 2002, and for the last first couple of years, I I, I frantically bought all kinds of things: books, posters, teacups, uh, all of those things. And uh, one thing that I can I can say interestingly, if you if you don't just pick one up um, at a at a let's say a touristy store like the fake market used to be or the chain member. But you go a little bit deeper and then in one of the hutongs, you buy it from an old man who has who has these things in a, um, on, a, on a blanket or something. Then they they gave it to you. They treated these things with a certain amount of respect, which is very different from the way we approach them. You know, it's, uh, to us, it's more like haha communist relics. And I am Hungarian. Even I th uh, look at it this way. Or uh, that about 10 years ago, they sold these Obama T-shirts, right? Which, which fused uh, Mao Zedong's and Obama's imagery. But uh, if you bought these from a senior citizen in Beijing or Shanghai or, or another city with long traditions, they didn't look at them this way at all. They did look at them as a, as a piece of their history and, and uh, part of the legacy of China. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Anybody else? It, yeah, this is this is the time to shine if you are you're a collector yourself. And well, if anybody, then maybe Bob can come in again. He, um, he runs he runs the stories of things event in Shanghai. Um well mine. Oh, sorry, Martin, go ahead. No, it's okay. You go ahead, then I'll go. <laughs> okay, I'll try to keep this as quick as possible. Um, <clears throat> um Emily knows my story, so I'll try to keep the, the five-sentence paragraph. Um, I'm an American uh, scholar of the Cultural Revolution, and uh, I, I think I'm unique in this panel in that <clears throat> when I was in high school and university, I was a member of a youth league of a Maoist party. Um, if anybody knows about the Revolutionary Communist Party USA in America, it's a small Maoist cult. That's the only way to... Uh -huh. I was part of a Maoist cult for m almost the entirety of my adolescence. Um and, uh, you know, I, I was a cashier at a Maoist bookstore, blah, 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 blah. Um, and um, one thing that once I finally moved to China, um, finally being able to achieve my dream of uh, acquiring large amounts of red relics was uh, wonderful, especially because my <clears throat> especially because my graduate advisor, if anybody knows who Dr. Douglas Reynolds was, rest in peace, um, he was an expert on Mao badges. And uh, he taught me how to distinguish real ones from fake ones. <laughs> um, he got me into Red Guard armband collections. So um, considering I've only lived in China for two years and I'm only 35 years old, um, I have a significant cultural revolution memorabilia collection. 
Um, and uh, thankfully, my my knowledge of Chinese words for certain uh, Marxist uh, terminology uh, definitely lets the guard down on a lot of old Red Guards or people who lived during that right. time, even right. maybe people who suffered through that time. So um, this uh, tonight was very much a treat for me. Um, it was good to hear the um, a different take, especially because I've only known a handful of British Maoists, most of whom came from the, the third wave of British Maoism after the arrest of Gang of Four. <laughs> Excellent, Drew. If you're not a member of RAS China yet, then uh, I, I would sign up because Bob's events, my events, uh, there are lots of other events. Well, l let me ask you this. What is the, the monthly dues? I'm I, willing to... We will send you everything. We will send you everything. Okay. Now. We will still keep... Emily it has my WeChat. Emily has my WeChat, so... All right. We will, we will make sure that we are connected. Uh, Bob? Uh, All right. Oh, yes. Thank you. I just wanted to say that, uh, unfortunately, Stories of Things has had to cancel Emily three times because of typhoons and COVID, but we are looking forward the next time we can meet together to, uh, to welcome Emily to Stories of Things at RAS. Yeah, I had an unfair and, advantage because uh, I always do everything uh, virtual no, 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 I'm not in China. <laughs> and, and just to underline what you said, uh, uh, Gabor before, each time I have Chinese guests in my house and they see these images of Mao that I have around, other things, they say, oh, I see you have great respect for Chairman Mao. And uh, it's, so the, the whole kitsch idea is totally gone. And I sort of catch myself and feel a bit guilty for having these images here uh, around for uh, other than, you know, admiration, uh, it's very, it's a very interesting uh, uh, situation. It can also go the other way. I've found my my IE is constantly tidying them away because she doesn't think it's appropriate mm. to have oh, objects now um, on display. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. My, my, my cleaning lady did the same with the bridge now, magnet. If I did, I have a whole selection of objects on display, and she's constantly trying to um, lose them behind bookshelves and things like uh, that. That's kind of funny because. Um, whenever, uh, Chinese people come to my, to my apartment, including the older folks, they're just like, not even in like, oh my gosh, that's so horrible. Like what you white man, what do you know about what went through? They're just like amazed at like, wow, I, you know, I haven't seen such and such since I was 16 and right. It depends um, on everybody's uh, personal life experience. I I used course, to have a cleaning lady course, who did the same thing. Uh, I had a, a you know, um, uh, like a restaurant menu on, on the side of my fridge held up by a Mao magnet. And then somehow I always found the Mao magnet under the menu after, after the cleaning lady has <laughs> left. So uh, thank you very much. I mean, this is a this is a very personal story for many of us. Uh, and of course, many of my Chinese friends as well. And certainly for Emily, I mean, I... Um, I can see that you are you are going on with this topic, and you are, frankly, I think you are unveiling um, an, a, a little known and little researched aspect of of something that everybody sees at least saw fleeting glimpses, even in the West. I mean, uh, we all saw that that people are interested in this, but to systematically look at the visual culture and it, it, its um, connections with how China is portrayed internationally, I think this is a fantastic multidisciplinary research that, that we would like to see. I mean, I, I, I um, recommend everybody to reach out to Emily for, for chapters of the book or, or, and get the book if you can. And obviously to follow her. I mean, uh, you are on Twitter. I can't remember if you're on LinkedIn as well. I follow you on Twitter. I, I am on LinkedIn, but I not very active <laughs> right so so uh this way we can follow what you're doing next and then we have um also the tradition of whenever one of our speakers comes up with with something new again 
we would like to welcome back um, the uh, the next topic. Let's say if you are coming out with new research or a new book or an update, then next year we will see you again. Well, that would be fantastic. And thank you so much, um, Gabor, for organizing it and to everyone for coming. And maybe just to sort of leave a little teaser, I'll just say that when we finally get to do the, the stories of, of things, um, I have a really fantastic uh, anti-imperialist woodcut um, that, that I want to share. So um, i yeah, really looking forward to that when we, can, when we can eventually do that. Thank you very much, everybody. Follow Emily, follow us. I don't know exactly what our next... Um, history event is going to be, but uh, there are a couple of options. I mean, uh, unfortunately, everybody in China is locked down and everybody out of China who publishes about China is frantically busy right now because they can travel and they are invited to the to the newly post-COVID conferences. Uh, many of our, um, uh, our regular speakers, Julia Lovo, Paul French, and so on. Uh, but we have a couple of nice options and I will announce them as soon as I can. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody for being here. Thank you, Emily. And uh, I wish you a good evening if you're in China. And, Come on. Uh, and, and any time of the day where you are, I hope to see you back very soon. Bye-bye for now. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Bye.